This program is called Who's Your Civil War Ancestor? I'm Don Wilson. Recently, we commemorated the sesquicentennial of the American Civil War. Much of the action took place right here in Prince William County. Why should we care? It was the most deadly war in American history. More than 620,000 people lost their lives. The number of deaths in the Civil War is close to the total of American deaths in all wars that came after it. About 2% of the entire American population died in the Civil War. That's several times the death rate in all later wars, 100 times the death rate of the Vietnam War. More than 1 million people were killed or wounded in the war. The property damage, particularly in the southern states, was catastrophic. The war marked the end of slavery in the United States. It resulted in the freedom of 4 million African Americans. Regardless of whether your ancestors fought in the war, if they lived in the United States, they were surely affected by it. Today, we will guide you to sources that can help uncover your ancestors' experiences. We will look at sources that focus on the military, civilian, and African American experience. To start, you need to pick a family member who was living in the United States about 1860. If you don't have that information, you will need to track at least one branch of your family back in time using the U.S. Census and vital records. Once you get to 1860, you will need to identify which relatives were adult in that year. If they were still alive in the 1870 census, then you know they survived the war. It happens that all branches of my family tree were living in the United States in 1860. This is a list of my father's male ancestors who were old enough to have served in the military. They all lived in Indiana. And here are my mother's male ancestors who might have served in the war, showing what states they were living in. I could have picked any of them to study, but for demonstration purposes, I'll pick the one I know did not survive the war. In 1860, James Hendricks was a farmer living in Madison County, Indiana. He was age 48, a native of North Carolina. The census shows he owned $600 in real estate and $300 in personal property. He and his wife, Mary Ann, had at least seven children who are shown with them on the census. We know that all four of his sons served in the war, but only one of them came home alive. From the 1870 census, it appears that James Hendricks has died. His widow Mary has a new husband, Nathaniel Johnson. In this census, two Hendricks children are living with them. Delilah, born about 1863, is James' youngest child. Thomas Johnson, age 17, is Nathaniel Johnson's son by a previous marriage. I found a marriage license for Mary Hendricks to Nathaniel Johnson in 1867 in neighboring Delaware County, Indiana. Question. Did James Hendricks serve in the war? He's in his late 40s, which makes him a bit old to have served in combat. Nevertheless, he disappears during the period 1863 to 1867 and there is a family tradition that he died in the war at Andersonville Prison, Georgia. 
Ancestry.com is one of the genealogy services that might be helpful. It is a good place to start, but it might not hold the answer. Their database of U.S. Civil War soldiers shows this, that 14 men named James Hendricks served in the war from Indiana. American Civil War Research Database is another important source for military service. If you have a Virginia driver's license or a Library of Virginia card, you can access the database for free on the Library of Virginia's website. There are a variety of searches you can do on this site, including by regiment and by battle. Today we are using the personnel directory. Choosing the Union Army, we put in James Hendricks' name and pick Indiana as the state served. Next, we get a screen of all the men named James Hendricks who served from Indiana. In some cases, it will give you place of residence. Madison County is not shown. Only two men of that name did not survive the war. The one on the second line resided or enlisted in Indianapolis, which is close to Madison County in central Indiana. The man on line 10, who also died during the war, lived in LaPorte County, which is in the distant northern part of the state. Clicking on the second entry, we find that James Hendricks enlisted in Company C, 2nd Indiana Cavalry, in October 1862. The crucial piece of information is that he was listed as a prisoner of war on May 9, 1864, at Varnell Station, Georgia. Fold3.com is a subscription website containing large quantities of military service records from the National Archives. Some of the data can be found on other sites, such as Ancestry.com and FamilySearch.org. This is a card index to military pensions of the Civil War. It shows that James L. Hendricks of Company C, 2nd Indiana Cavalry, had a widow who applied for a pension in January 1865, and that he had one or more children who were eligible for a minor's pension. Here is the paperwork I submitted in April 1968 to apply for a copy of uh, James L. Hendricks pension file. Needless to say, in the past 50 years, the cost of obtaining a pension file has gone up dramatically, though the process is pretty much the same. The thick packet I received contained papers detailing his service history, including his enlistment at Indianapolis, muster rolls in which he is shown as present or sick, or absent as Gart at Brig. Finally, he was reported as captured near Varnell Station, Georgia, and died at Andersonville, Georgia, July 2nd, 1864. In 1868, James's widow, Mary Johnson, applied for a pension for their two minor children. Sarah and Delilah, providing the girls birth dates. Although Mary had to provide proof of her marriage to James, she was unable to locate an official record. She got depositions from people who had known her in North Carolina. She also submitted an official record of her second marriage. 
a document of special interest to me is a deposition by James's oldest daughter, Nancy, my great-great-grandmother. Eventually, I visited the site of Andersonville Prison, where James spent the last few weeks of his life and where he is buried. Here are important general sources for Civil War data. The National Park Service and the National Archives are free sites that have some basic information. When looking for your ancestor in compiled military records, bits of information you have learned from the 1860 census will be helpful, including his occupation, his age, birthplace, place of residence, and names of his next of kin. Be aware that your ancestor may have served in more than one unit. He may have used an assumed name. Hopefully that will be cleared up when he applied for a pension. And he may have paid someone else to serve as a substitute for him. More than 178,000 African Americans served in U.S. military units during the last two years of the war. Search for their service records in many of the same sources in which whites were registered. The National Archives and State Archives have a variety of special military records not all of which are online. They include records of prison camps and hospitals, draft registration lists, Confederate paroles at the end of the war, and records of Civil War cemeteries. Later records that will help prove your ancestors' military service include, for a Union veteran, his federal pension, if he served in the Confederacy, his pension would be found in the state where he lived after the war. Pensions were not generally issued until more than 20 years after the war. Records of veterans' retirement homes may also be valuable. The 1890 Special Census of Union veterans survives for about half the states. The 1910 census asks if you served in the Union or Confederate Army or Navy. The 1930 census has a question about which war you served in. Civil War veterans organizations such as the Grand Army of the Republic and the Confederate Veterans published many stories of their members' lives. A wide range of sources can throw light on the lives of their, your civilian ancestors during the war. Citizens who furnished supplies and services to the Confederacy are documented on Fold 3. Civilian employees of the federal government are documented at the National Archives. Local courts recorded the everyday lives of citizens. City directories may show you where your ancestors lived and their occupations. People who claim to be Union sympathizers in the South could file claims for losses suffered at federal hands. Those are records of the Southern Claims Commission. The National Archives has records of civilian prisoners. The first income tax in U.S. history was applied during the war, though it affected very few people. And, of course, Civil War period newspapers for your ancestors' city will tell what was affecting them and may mention them by name. To get the full flavor of your ancestor's life, 
you can look for memoirs or personal narratives of people of the time, as well as battle and campaign histories. Muster rolls and compiled service records of the people your ancestor knew will put his life in context. Maps of the time show not only battlefields, but roads, towns, and the houses of many civilians. Numerous photos have survived, and many museums contain artifacts and uniforms of the war. The largest source of African American history for the Civil War period is the National Archives. The Freedmen's Bureau was created at the end of the war to help former slaves transition to being American citizens. Its bank records register their earliest savings accounts and provide details about their families. How were our ancestors affected by the war? Find out more about what your ancestors read and how they lived using Cornell University's website and 10,000 Civil War links. For further research, you can study Relic's Civil War Pathfinder called Chasing the Civil War. So, if you're asked the question, who's your Civil War ancestor? The answer is anyone in your family who lived through the events of the war. Thank you for your attention. We invite you to let Relic staff help you with help you with your research